Okay, last time we talked about Bitcoin in general, we saw an overview of the whole protocol from the point of view of a normal node who's not doing the mining and also from the point of view of a miner. In this session, we're going to talk about some of the remaining issues. So one of the remaining issues, which I uh, kind of alluded to at the end of the previous session was the incentives for the miners. So when I was explaining the protocol, that's actually uh, the protocol that honest people will follow. Right, so that that's generally our assumption in this course. When I'm designing a protocol, I say what an honest person would do, and then I have to go back and prove that there is no incentive for dishonesty. I have to show that being honest is actually incentivized, and it's in everyone's best interest to be honest, and things like that. So uh, we will get to more details of that later. But for now, I just want to focus on a particular problem. And that's the problem of mining and why would anyone mine, okay? So this is the question. Let's say uh, you're a node on this network and we talked about this in the last session, anyone on the network has the same permission as anyone else. So if I join this network, I can decide whether I want to mine a new block or not. And I said in the last session that there are some people who are doing the mining, we call them miners. And there are of course, the vast majority of nodes on the network who are not doing mining. But joining the network and doing the message passing and so on, that's really cheap. I can just do it on my own laptop. I can uh, connect to the Bitcoin network. Whenever I hear a valid transaction or a valid block, I would just uh, tell all of my neighbors about it. But mining is actually really expensive. I need particular hardware to do it. I need to also pay a lot for electricity. It's competitive, so it's costly. And so the question is, why would anyone do mining? Why would any of the nodes decide to mine? And we saw part of the answer to this in the previous session. And the answer we had to this was uh, basically because of block rewards, right? So I said that whenever you're creating a block, you can also create a transaction in this block that pays some new units of currency to the miner. And also this is how we are creating new units of currency because we don't really have a central bank to print money so this is solving two problems at the same time. It's rewarding the miners and it's also creating new units of Bitcoin. Okay. Now, what is the amount? Originally, the amount of the block reward was 50 Bitcoins. So that's the original value. But there is a problem with having a fixed reward per block, right? So let's say that Every time that a miner adds a new block, let's say this is my blockchain and I'm adding this new block. And in this block, I can include a transaction. And let's say I always put this as my first transaction. I always put it as transaction zero. And the way this transaction looks like is like this. It doesn't have any inputs but it just has one output and it's paying the 50 Bitcoin or whatever the block reward is to the miner. So it has 50 Bitcoins and it also has the public key of the miner here, okay? And we said that the miner can include a transaction like this in their block. And when the other nodes are verifying the validity of a block, they would consider this transaction to be valid. So this is the only transaction in which uh, we don't have the rule that the sum of inputs should be greater than or equal to the sum of outputs. Because the whole point of that rule was to stop people from creating new units of currency. And we want the miners to be able to create new units of currency whenever they're adding a new block. But now the problem with this kind of reward, the problem with just having a fixed reward is that this will eventually create an infinite supply of the currency, right? So if every block would just create 50 new units of Bitcoin, 
I could potentially have an infinite amount of Bitcoin over time. Now, I don't want to get into economics. This is a computer science course. Is it good to have infinitely many Bitcoins? Is it bad? I don't know. But uh, Bitcoin doesn't like that. So instead, they have a rule. And there is a rule that says this block reward is cut in half after roughly every four years. So the block reward is halved every four years. Nice. So it originally started at 50 Bitcoin, then it became 25, then it became 12 and a half, and now it's 6.25. But I mean, this is uh, quite a lot of money because if you think about it, uh, what is the Bitcoin price today? Actually, let me just check that on Google. Yeah, one Bitcoin is 66,000 US dollars right now. So 6.25 Bitcoin would be uh, 412,000 US dollars. So just by adding one block, that's the reward that you will get. And of course, this reward is huge. So a lot of people are incentivized to do mining. A lot of people are actually incentivized uh, to try to add new blocks. But also because this uh, reward gets halved every four years, the total amount of Bitcoins that are ever going to come into existence is actually limited. And I think uh, the limit is somewhere around 21 million. So we will never mine more than 21 million Bitcoins. Okay. But this doesn't quite solve the problem. Because, well, now we have two remaining problems. The first problem is, suppose I'm a miner and now I have an incentive to uh, mine blocks and to add new blocks to the blockchain. That's fine. But let's say I'm not an honest miner. I don't want to just follow the protocol all the time. I'm just a rational miner. And whenever we say rational in this course, we mean rational in the sense of game theory. So someone is rational if they only care about their own payoff, if they only care about their own income, they don't care about anyone else. And uh, so they would do whatever maximizes their own income. Okay. So if I have a rational miner who just wants to maximize their own income, of course, in this case, they would uh, keep adding blocks. So I have incentivized that, but there is no incentive to put transactions into the blocks, right? So the next question I have here is why would a miner mine non-empty blocks? And by non-empty, I mean blocks that contain some transaction. Because if I'm getting the rewards anyway, I can just create an empty block. Remember, a block is valid if it satisfies the validity constraints and the hardest validity constraint was proof of work. So I have to solve the proof of work puzzle. But let's say I do that. Even if I do it for an empty block, I get to add my block to the blockchain. So now there is no incentive for me to add any transactions into my blocks, but then that defeats the whole purpose of the currency, right? The whole reason we have uh, this blockchain and consensus and all of that is so that uh, we can uh, all agree on the history of transactions. Remember when we were talking about double spending and so on? So in order to agree on the history of transactions, we created this blockchain, but now the miners have uh, no incentive to actually include the transactions into the blocks. So they might just create empty blocks. Now, we solve this pretty much in the same way that we solved it for the centralized ledger case or the central bank digital currency case. And this is by using transaction fees. Okay. So again, I said that in every transaction, in order for the transaction to be valid, the sum of inputs should be greater than or equal to the sum of outputs. But I didn't say that they should be exactly equal. So when we were talking about this, I said, well, maybe you want to burn some money. But actually in Bitcoin, that money is not burned. So for every transaction, 
the difference, the sum of inputs of that transaction minus the sum of outputs is paid to the miner. And when I say the miner, of course, I mean the miner who puts this transaction on the blockchain. Okay, so the miner who includes this transaction uh, in their block and adds it to the blockchain. Okay. Uh, I'm getting some uh, voice from one of you. Please mute yourself if you're not talking to me. Okay, great. So the miners are getting rewarded in two ways. There is this fixed block reward, and then there are the transaction fees. And so one way to implement this is to say that this transaction zero that has uh, no inputs, it can just have an output that goes to the miner, but the amount of the output can actually be the block reward, whatever the block reward is at the moment plus the sum of all these transaction fees. And again, all the nodes on the network will verify that this transaction has the correct form and it's paying the correct reward to the miner. And if it's paying an incorrect amount of reward, we would just say this transaction is invalid and having an invalid transaction would make the entire block invalid. So the block will not be added to the blockchain. Okay. Now this also solves a different problem and that's the problem that, well, the block reward is tending to zero, right? So after a while, the block reward will be so small that no one would care about it. Or, I mean, after even more time, it will be literally zero. Because these are like integers and we're uh, rounding down. So when the block reward becomes zero, the idea is that the transaction fees will pay for everything. So the transaction fees will be the main incentive for the miners to do the mining. But nowadays, again, the block rewards are much larger than the transaction fees. Uh, there are all sorts of guesses about when this will change, probably in five years, maybe, the transaction fee rewards will uh, exceed the block rewards. But anyway, these are the two ways that we're paying our miners. Okay, but some of you have already noticed that I said the block reward is halved every four years. And that's kind of a strange thing to say because I'm basically referencing time here. And on the blockchain, we don't really have a synchronized time, right? Because remember, I have a peer-to-peer -peer network. There are many different computers on this network and there is no guarantee that they all have a synchronized time. So, if I'm creating a block or if I'm creating a transaction, you can say, well, add some metadata at the time that you created it. Maybe use your you know, Linux or Unix time and add that there. And uh, that's fine. But what if someone is lying about the time? So I cannot just trust the miners to add the time to their blocks. I mean, I will ask them to add a timestamp but I cannot trust that they will do it honestly and they will not uh, actually play with it, especially if we are close to the time when the block reward is going to get halved, right? So if I have, for example, suppose that, I don't know, right now the block reward is six and suppose that in one hour, the block reward is going to get halved and it's going to become three, right? Now, a miner might actually uh, try to find a block and maybe it's after the time when the block reward was halved, but they can just lie about the time and they can put a fake timestamp into their block so that they can get the bigger reward. So it doesn't make sense to talk about time. And generally we have this problem in blockchains. We can never really talk about time. So instead of saying every four years, I, I can change this and I can map it to the number of blocks. I can say every, whatever, every these many blocks, every X blocks, okay? And if I'm not mistaken, this is 210,000. So 
In Bitcoin, the block reward is cut in half after every 210,000 blocks. I'm not completely sure about this number, but I think it was something like that. Okay. So this makes sure that uh, everyone on the network, since they are reaching a consensus about the blockchain, they're also reaching a consensus about how much reward every miner should get. Because when you're adding a block, you're saying what the previous block is. So everyone knows what your block number is. Everyone knows the distance from your block to the first block, to the Genesis block. So uh, everyone can check this, that uh, if 210,000 blocks have passed, then the reward is divided in half. Okay. Now, these are all good. But then remember when we were talking about proof of work, we said that we have a difficulty level. So in proof of work, we had a difficulty threshold. And we called this D. And the idea was that anyone who had uh, who was finding a new block and wanted to add this new block B had to ensure that hash of this new block is at most D. Okay. And reducing D would make it uh, a harder puzzle. Increasing D would make it an easier puzzle. Okay. But now the problem is. I can just calculate how many hashes I need to compute in expectation to find a value that is less than or equal to D. And this is what we did in our proof of work lecture. Now, I'm giving people incentives to do mining and these incentives are paid in Bitcoins and the price of Bitcoin is going up. So as time goes on, more and more people would want to be miners. More and more people would want to take part here so the total hash rate, the total uh, capacity of the network to compute hashes is going to increase. And actually, let me show this to you. Bitcoin hash rate, I'm just Googling it. Okay, so this is a chart of the total hash rate of Bitcoin. Now, uh, yeah, this one is the price. This one is the hash rate. And these, these are hash rates in terahashes per second. And terahash, well, tera means 10 to the power of 12. And right now it's around 600 million terahashes. So uh, that's six times 10 to the power of 12 plus six plus two. So 10 to the power of 20, right? So in every second, they're computing six times 10 to the power of 20 hashes, which is an extremely high number. It's just mind boggling. This is like more than uh, the ability of all the supercomputers are the main supercomputers in the world. And it's just amazing. Uh, and it makes sense because the Bitcoin prices are so high right now. You can see the Bitcoin price here, right? Today, it's like 63,000. Uh, so, okay, now I'm going to have a problem. If I had a fixed difficulty threshold, let's say if I said that you need to compute 1 million hashes in order to add a block. So I choose this difficulty so that on average, you need to compute 1 million hashes. When the hash rate of the network goes up, when there are so many people computing hashes, then I will have more blocks. But that's not great because I'm using my blocks to keep time. Basically, I want my block reward to be cut in half, let's say, every four years. And I'm saying four years is almost 210,000 blocks. So in Bitcoin in general, our goal is to have one block almost every 10 minutes. Okay. Now, why 10 minutes? Because the original designer decided on 10 minutes. It's an arbitrary number. But there are two use cases. One use case is for timing in general. So if I want to talk about four years, I talk about these many blocks. 
okay? And then the other point here is that I'm using the gossip protocol and there's always going to be a delay in the gossip protocol. So I want to make sure that everyone on the network has a chance, has enough time to hear about all of the new blocks. If instead of 10 minutes, I had, for example, uh, no limit, I, I could say you can create blocks as fast as you want. Then when the hash rate of the network went up, they would maybe create tons of blocks and then these blocks will have to be propagated using the gossip protocol. And then some nodes on the network are just not fast enough. They don't have a fast enough internet connection or they don't have enough processing power to process all of it. And then uh, they would uh, run behind and cannot keep up with the chain. Okay, so I want a, a new block every 10 minutes. But if I want a new block every 10 minutes, and if the number of hashes that can be computed on the whole network is going up, this means that I have to have a way to adjust the difficulty. I have to have a way to make my puzzle more difficult or less difficult. And this is again fine because I can use uh, the blocks themselves. So remember, I tell everyone, I tell uh, all the miners to also include the timestamp in the block. And the timestamp of every block should be after the timestamp of the previous block, of course, because otherwise the miner is cheating. So I'm pretty sure that they can lie about the time that they found this block, but they cannot lie by too much. Okay. Now, I can also uh, use these timestamps in my propagation algorithm, in my gossip protocol. And I can say, hey, if you saw a block and the timestamp was in the future, you know that the person creating this block is cheating, so don't propagate that block. Okay, so this creates some incentive for the miners to be kind of honest about the timestamp. They can still change the timestamp a little bit, but they wouldn't change it by too much because if they put it too far in the past, it would be before the timestamp of the last block and then their block becomes invalid. And if they put it too far in the future, it will not get propagated. And if it doesn't get propagated, someone else's block might get propagated sooner and then you might uh, not be able to add your block to the consensus chain, okay? So I'm going to include timestamps in the blocks, but I don't trust the timestamps. I just trust that they're almost correct, but not 100%. Now, my goal is to have one block every 10 minutes. So here's what I can do. I can say, look at the last 100 blocks. And again, 100 is an arbitrary number here. I can look at any number of blocks, but let's say I look at the last 100 blocks in my blockchain. And I ask how much time did it take for these blocks to be mined? And let's say on average, right? So basically take the time that the first of these blocks was mined and take the time that the last one was mined, subtract them, divide by 100. That gives you the average time that it took for us to mine the past 100 blocks, right? Now, I would ideally like this average time to be 10 minutes. It might be that uh, there was not enough hash power on the network, so the average time was actually more than 10 minutes. If the average time was more than 10 minutes, this has never happened in practice, but let's say uh, this happens. Let's say that uh, a bunch of the miners are giving up on mining and they don't want to mine anymore. So my hash power has gone down. So the average time to add a block is now more than 10 minutes. Then I would decrease the difficulty, which means that I would increase this number D. I would make the puzzle easier to solve. On the other hand, uh, in the much more uh, normal case that is always happening in Bitcoin where the hash rate is going up, I'm going to observe that these previous blocks were mined much faster. They took on average, let's say nine minutes instead of 10 minutes. So then I'm going to make my proof of work puzzle more difficult. So the difficulty of the proof of work puzzle uh, in let's say block N, it's going to depend on how fast the proof of work puzzle was solved in the previous blocks. And I can just have a formula for it. You can read the original Bitcoin paper for the formula. Uh, 
But the main point is that if I see I have too many blocks, I make my uh, difficulty more. So I actually decrease the threshold. And if I see that I don't have enough blocks, I make it easier to solve the proof of work. But this is done by a fixed formula that is part of the protocol. So everyone on the network knows this formula. And because everyone on the network knows the previous blocks in the blockchain, everyone can just apply that. And so everyone knows for this particular block what difficulty threshold you need. And they would accept this uh, block from you if and only if you give a proof of work solution that matches that difficulty threshold. Now you can have all sorts of different ways of setting this. As long as you somehow make sure that you get one block roughly every 10 minutes, it's fine. Or again, this 10 is also an arbitrary number. You can choose any other number that you want. Okay. So we talked about uh, some of the points here about uh, what happens when uh, a miner adds a new transaction, they're going to get the transaction fee and all of these things. But one other point that I have to mention, I don't know if I've already said this, is that the blocks actually have a size limit. And that also has to do with the gossip protocol. Because if the blocks don't have any size limit, if I can have a block that is, let's say one terabyte, it's going to take an insane amount of time to propagate this. And again, many of the nodes on the network are just unable to uh, store this and calculate with it and do computations and check that all the transactions are valid and so on. So because we want the network to be open to everyone, we want it to be open also to people who don't have a great internet connection and to people uh, who don't maybe have a lot of computational power and so on. So mining needs a lot of computational power, but being a normal node on the network should not need a lot of computational power. So for that reason, we're going to say that the blocks have a bounded size. And in Bitcoin, a block can be at most 1 million bytes. Block is at most 10 to the power of six bytes. Now, there are some recent updates that actually kind of increase this to four times 10 to the power of six. But the important point is that it's almost one megabyte or four megabytes of data. So you can expect it to be propagated within 10 minutes. Again, all of these numbers are arbitrary, but you have to choose them realistically. You have to choose them such that you can be sure that your blocks get propagated in time and everyone on the network can hear about them. Okay. Now, the other point I want to talk about is the issue of forks. And we basically say there is a fork whenever there are two different blocks that are referencing the same block as their previous block. So I can have, let's say my blockchain here, and this goes on. And let's say at some point, there are two different competing blocks. And we've seen this before. So let's say this was uh, block n minus one. And then for block n, I have two competing variants. So two miners have found uh, valid blocks and they found it, let's say at approximately the same time, they propagated it on the network and uh, their blocks are both referencing the same block BN minus one as the previous block. Now, when we were talking uh, of the network from the point of view of a normal node, we said that, well, the node just keeps track of the whole tree of blocks. So it keeps track of both branches of this fork. And then when one of them gets longer, the longer branch is going to be the consensus chain. Okay, so the longest chain is always the consensus chain. Now, here's the thing. Suppose that this block was found first, and let's say that we had a transaction in this block. So maybe I had this transaction, and let's say that in this transaction, in the green transaction, Alice pays one Bitcoin to Bob. Okay. Now, this green transaction appears here, but it doesn't appear here. And then let's say that there is a different block added here. 
So now my longest chain is this one. And remember, the longest chain is the consensus chain. So everyone on the network believes that this transaction is finalized and believes that this one Bitcoin belongs to Bob. And now maybe Bob uses uh, this one Bitcoin to pay someone else. So maybe here I have a red transaction in which Bob pays the one Bitcoin to someone else, to Carol. Okay. So now Carol thinks that she has one Bitcoin and everyone on the network agrees with that. But then later on, let's say that something like this happens. Let's say that a miner extends this one and then another miner extends here. So now my consensus chain is shifting. Now the chain uh, at the bottom is longer. So this is now my new consensus chain. And everyone on the network is following this new consensus chain. So from the point of view of everyone in the network, Alice did not pay that one Bitcoin to Bob. So Bob didn't have that one Bitcoin to pay it to Carol. So both of these transactions are now invalid. Or well, not invalid. They're at least not in the consensus. They're not finalized. Now, this is a problem. It's a problem because basically I can make a transaction and I can see that my transaction is added to the blockchain, but then later on my transaction can get reverted. And it gets reverted not because the block gets removed, but because there is a different fork that gets longer. And when this different fork gets longer, then all of the blocks in the previous fork, which is now shorter, are ignored. So everyone believes in the longest chain. And that was a rule that we needed in order to have consensus. So we cannot change that. Everyone will always believe in the longest chain. Okay. Now, but what are the problems here? So let's say I had this block here, BN, and this other block, let's call it BN plus one. And let's call this one BN prime, BN plus one prime. And now this is BN plus two prime. So basically, as soon as this B prime N plus two is added, I know that the blocks BN and BN plus one are not in the consensus chain anymore. Okay. And when this happens, we say that these blocks are reverted. Okay, so these are reverted. Now, what happens when a block is reverted? Well, the first thing is that any transaction that was in these blocks is definitely going to be ignored. So any transaction in reverted blocks is also reverted. Okay. Now, it might be that these transactions already exist in the longest chain as well. So maybe when Alice paid Bob, the transaction that Alice used to pay Bob was added by the miner to BN, but maybe the miner of BN prime also added that transaction. So in that case, that transaction will not be reverted because again, I only care about the transactions that are in my longest chain, that are in my consensus chain. But the transactions that appeared in some other chain, for example, this red transaction here, they are reverted. Now uh, everyone is following the longest chain and no one cares that you have a transaction in a different chain. Transactions in different chains are just not finalized. But then the other thing that happens here is about the rewards. So remember, the way I'm paying the rewards is using transactions, right? So basically every one of my blocks contains a transaction which paid the reward to the miner. And we said that this is a special transaction. It's the only transaction that cre can create new units of currency. But now if this block is no longer in the consensus chain, then none of its transactions are in the consensus chain which means that the miner of this block does not get any rewards either. 
So no rewards for the miners of reverted blocks. This means that if you're a miner, you really hate it when your block gets reverted. Because if your block gets reverted, you basically lose all of the rewards, all of the transaction fees and the block rewards that you were getting here. So let's say that my chain was this, and then I added BN as a miner. Now, when I added it, I was super happy because I was thinking that I'm getting all this reward. It's amazing. Like I'm getting half a million dollars because I could find this. But then someone else finds a block here and then their chain gets longer. And when that happens, I will not get any of my rewards because now my block is outside of consensus. And so all of the transactions, including my rewards, are also outside of consensus. Okay. Now, this is kind of terrible, but it also gives the miners uh, some sort of incentive not to create forks, right? So remember, we had this rule that we said, if you're an honest miner, you should always try to extend the longest chain. So in this case, if I'm an honest miner, I should try to extend this one and not this one, right? But this is also something that is incentivized. It's in my best interest to do so. Because if I extend this one, there is a good chance that the block that I add here will not be in the longest chain because this other one is longer and then someone will add a block here, right? And if my block is not in the longest chain, I'm not going to get any of the block rewards. So as a miner, I will lose money by being dishonest. So I would prefer to be honest and always uh, try to extend the longest chain. Okay, there is a question in the chat. Uh, if the nodes don't propagate the Bob to Carol transaction due to non-finalized Alice to Bob, would the transaction not circulate and disappear? Uh, no. So here's the thing. Uh, the nodes will propagate the transactions even if the transactions uh, are not yet finalized. So remember, the propagation is basically based on the mempool of the node. So... As a node, I will hear of a ton of transactions that are not in the blockchain yet, but as long as they're valid, I would still propagate them. So in this case, the transactions, both transactions, both green and red will be propagated anyway. But this question actually gets us to the next point that I wanna make. And it's what we call a double spending attack again. And you will see how this can create a problem. Okay, so let's talk about this. Double spending is always our biggest enemy in this course. And I can have a double spending attack. Okay. Now, the quintessential example of this are the vending machines that use Bitcoin. Okay, so I think we had some of these in Hong Kong too. Bitcoin-based vending machines. So the idea here is that you have a vending machine, maybe, I don't know, whatever it's selling, it's maybe selling some food or uh, some electronic appliances, and you want to pay using Bitcoin, okay? Now, how does this work? Well, the seller or the merchant basically gives you their identity. They give you their public key, and maybe they give it to you as a QR code uh, on the vending machine, okay? So the merchant publishes their public key or their Bitcoin identity. And then the customer should create a transaction that pays the merchant, okay? Customer creates some transaction, let's say TX, paying the merchant. or paying whatever the fee is. So based on what I have chosen on the vending machine, there is a price. I'm going to create a transaction that pays that price. And then I'm going to give this transaction to the merchant. So customer gives this transaction to the merchant. 
okay? And now the merchant verifies that this transaction is valid. And this is just the same validity check that we have seen before. So it, it checks proof of consent. It checks that sum of inputs is less than sum of outputs. I'm sorry, bigger than sum of outputs. It uh, checks that there is no double spending. It checks that one of the outputs is paying the merchants and it's paying the correct amount to the merchants. Okay. But now here's the thing. Can the merchant just give the item to the customer based on just seeing the transaction? Well, the answer is no, because maybe this transaction is not even propagated in the network. Maybe no one else knows about this transaction and maybe the customer does a double spend. So maybe this is my problem. The problem is that the customer has created this transaction and it's paying some money to the merchant and it's using some coin that the customer owned from a previous transaction. But maybe at the same time, the customer is creating another transaction and she's using the same coin and this is just paying to the customer herself. Okay. So this is the classical double spending problem. Now, if the customer only shows this transaction to the merchant, the merchant cannot be sure that this transaction will even be propagated on the network. So the merchant is not going to trust the customer. Instead, the merchant is going to say, if this transaction is valid, I'm going to publish it myself. Okay. So the merchant is going to publish the transaction. And also, of course, provide the good, or provide the item that was bought. Okay, but even this has a problem, right? Because the customer can still do double spending. So let's say I'm a malicious customer. I'm a dishonest customer. I'm going to give this transaction to the merchant and the merchant verifies that, well, he's being paid in this transaction. And then he just publishes this transaction and because it's a vending machine, it has to work really fast. So it just gives me the item, right? But now I can create this other transaction at the same time and I can publish this too. So if I do this, again, we have the classical double spending scenario where some of the network have heard about this transaction first and the rest of the network have heard about this transaction first. And well, of course, uh, one of them, at most one of them is going to be added to the blockchain, but it's the miners who decide which one. Right. So if you're a miner who's seeing all of these transactions, you get to choose which transaction to put in your uh, block that you're adding to the blockchain. You cannot add both of them, of course, because they're double spending, but you can choose which one to add. Now, here's the part where the attack gets interesting. So this is my first double spending attack. And the idea is that I'm going to bribe the miner. Okay. So let's say that Alice wants to buy something from the vending machine. And let's say that there was a transaction before that paid Alice. So it paid whatever, let's say one Bitcoin to Alice. One Bitcoin is too much, but this is just an example. Okay. Now, Alice is going to create two transactions because she wants to double spend. And the first transaction is going to pay some money to the vending machine. And let's say that the amount that she had to pay to the vending machine is like 0.8 Bitcoin. Okay, so I'm paying 0.8 Bitcoin to the merchant. Let's call the merchant Bob. And then, I'm paying the rest to myself, right? So I'm saying maybe pay 0.1 Bitcoin to Alice herself. 
Okay. And of course, it's going to take this output as the input of this transaction. Okay. So this transaction has an input that is one Bitcoin and it's spending 0.9 Bitcoin. So 0.1 Bitcoin is going uh, as transaction fee to the miner. And let's say this is the transaction that Alice gives to Bob. So Bob publishes this transaction and he thinks, well, this transaction is probably going to end up on the blockchain. And maybe Bob even waits for a little bit. Maybe Bob publishes this transaction and then waits for, let's say, 10 seconds to see if he hears of any double spending transaction. Uh, and again, these transactions are still not finalized. They're still not added to the blockchain. So if Alice does a double spending immediately, Bob might uh, figure that out. But at the same time, Bob cannot wait for 10 minutes. Bob cannot wait for the transaction to actually be added to the blockchain because this is a vending machine and 10 minutes is just too much. So maybe Bob is waiting for one minute. And after one minute, if Bob is not seeing any double spending transactions, Bob's point of view is that, well, I published this transaction and everyone on the network has heard of this transaction. So now if Alice does a double spending, if Alice creates another transaction that uses the same output as its input, then everyone is going to ignore that transaction. That transaction is not even going to get propagated. So the miners are not going to know about this other transaction and the transaction that's actually paying me, Bob, is going to end up in the blockchain. So that's Bob's way of looking at it. But Alice has another trick. Alice creates this other transaction, let's call this TX prime. And in this one, she pays, uh, let's say 0.8 Bitcoin to herself. And that's it. There is no other output. Now, if you look at this, this one is paying a transaction fee of 0 0.1. This one, is paying a transaction fee of 0 0.2. So if you're a miner, you would prefer to include this transaction. So in some sense, Alice is bribing the miner to put the transaction that is good for her. So if I want to go over the attack one more time, Alice first creates this transaction that is paying Bob and maybe paying a little bit back to Alice herself and it has some transaction fee. She gives this transaction to Bob, but Bob publishes this transaction. And then Bob sees that this transaction has been propagated in the whole network, but it's still not added to the blockchain. At this point, Bob trusts that this transaction will eventually be added to the blockchain, so he gives the item to Alice. Alice walks away from the vending machine. She creates this transaction. This transaction has a higher fee than the previous one. Now, she cannot easily propagate this one, because if she tries to propagate it in the normal way, if she tries to just send this transaction on the network using the gossip protocol, everyone has already heard of the previous transaction and they will not collaborate. The honest participants will not collaborate with this. They would say this is an invalid transaction. But what Alice can do is just take this transaction and send it to the big miners. Now, a miner who has heard of both of these transactions would prefer this second transaction. So if I'm the miner of the next block, I get to choose which transactions to put in my block. And if I'm rational, which most miners are, I'm only thinking of maximizing my own payoff. So I want to get as much in transaction fees as possible. So I'm just going to include this transaction. And that means that Alice got the item but she didn't pay for it. She of course paid this transaction fee to the miner, but she didn't pay the price of the item. This is now still belonging to Alice. And this attack transaction actually ended up in the consensus chain. Okay. So basically if the miner adds TX prime to the blockchain, then the attack is successful. And we know that the miner has uh, 
an incentive to do this. And actually, Alice can increase the bribe. Alice can increase the transaction fee to increase the chances that the miners would take her attack transaction. So it's literally just a bribing attack. Now, what is the solution here? Well, the solution is uh, to not have uh, a vending machine that just gives the items immediately. So you have to wait for the transaction to get added to the blockchain. Okay, and that's it for this session. I'll see you next week. So the solution is that the merchant, Bob, should wait for the transaction to be added to the blockchain. But of course, this is also problematic in the sense that we have a transaction, sorry, we have a block in the blockchain almost every 10 minutes. So this means that the transaction takes at the very least 10 minutes. So you cannot have a vending machine where you pay something and in Bitcoin and it immediately gives you the item. Of course, you have seen these kinds of vending machines in Hong Kong. They're just risking it. They're just saying as soon as they see the transaction, they assume that it's going to be fine. So you can do this kind of attack on them.